what time are we at? 35? 35. All right. Well, uh, let's get started then. Uh, you can all hear me, right? Okay, well, uh, thank you for coming to uh, the session today uh, called Summing Up the Summit. Uh, this is uh, really a, a chance to let you all know, know about this event that we had a month ago in DC, but really um, the sequence of events that led us there uh, and led to the development of this thing called the OpenSSF Mobilization Plan. I am joined on this panel uh, uh, by a number of esteem, esteemed, esteemed, uh, esteemed guests. Uh, here's that, that Max Headroom kind of glitching going. Uh, why don't I start with uh, Amelie Karan. Uh, Amelie, you're uh, a special fellow with the Atlantic Council, but could you kind of go deeper in kind of your background and, and uh, uh, tell us just more about you and kind of what you're doing with the AC but, but have done before? Yeah, um, so let me see, 27 years in the technology space, but um, you know, actually getting into it from open source way back prior to college. So I've been really tied to this community since the early 90s at this point, um, but also been an advocate in and out of the private and public sector. I've, I've spent a, a, was a decade in as a federal employee uh, with a stint, uh, you know, breaking between that for Disney and, and, and uh, you know, a couple of companies since then. Um, but, uh, you know, as anywhere from, you know, starting out as an engineering grunt, uh, to having to put all the stuff together to architecture, uh, primarily along the security side of the things. And right now, uh, as a, um, I guess it would be the technology relationship manager, <laughs> if you want to do an office based thing for a large gaming company. So, um, but doing a lot of writing on the side, cause this is an interest area that, uh, not only do I have a vested personal interest in, but professionally, I think it's a good area for folks who have the skills and interest in, and varied backgrounds to participate in. Thanks. Thanks. Um, and you and I both testified, at, uh, on a house committee, uh, panel, uh, right before this event, it was like, uh, this crazy week uh, on May 11th, it was right. Uh, the House uh, Science Committee. Uh, they were asking about security and open source code. Uh, that was a lot of fun. It had. Uh, yeah, it was. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's surprising to to get testimony in within uh, a five day window. So that was always fun too. Uh, and uh, I also have next to me uh, Trey Her. Trey works at the Atlantic Council as well. Um, uh, Trey's a coworker of Amelie's. Trey, could you introduce yourself and and let folks know? about both what you're doing at AC, but also maybe a little bit of context for the work that you're doing. Yeah, sure. So, uh, hi, everybody. I'm Trey. I run the Cyber Statecraft Initiative at the Atlantic Council. AC is a foreign policy national security think tank based in Washington, D.C., uh, and our team works on technology policy, geopolitics, and InfoSec, sort of the, the crossover of the three. Amelie is one of our fellows um, who's doing some work with us on open source. Uh, we have been working on software supply chain issues since 2019, trying to profile this as an important supply chain policy issue, trying to put some data together on attacks that we've seen, vulnerability disclosures that could have led to attacks that were interesting uh, for our community. And with uh, in conjunction with Brian and some of the other folks at OpenSF, uh, this year and next we'll be doing some work on trying to bring uh, more policy attention and hopefully help into the work that the mobilization streams are doing, as well as some ongoing security projects across open source. Um, as well, and I think for anybody who's here who's not necessarily as directly involved with OpenSSF, we're really hoping to broaden the community uh, of maintainers and developers and repo owners who are engaged in the policy process. Uh, so for folks that maybe haven't been in policy before, or interested in it, want to see how to get involved, uh, please feel free to shoot us a note or find me after the talk, because there'll be a lot to do in the next, I don't know, 10 years, but at least the next year and a half. Now, Trey's played an integral role in the last six months in the development of both the, the plan and the event and some of our thinking in this space. Uh, but somebody who's been with uh, the OpenSSF project longer than I have, uh, who's been with the Linux Foundation for quite a while as well, is David Wheeler. Uh, and David, could you introduce yourself as well and kind of give a little bit of, of a background of the, a brief background of the OpenSSF, kind of where it came from. Uh, and, uh, and also your background is very much in the Washington area and, and you have some insight into to kind of engagement with government as well, don't you? Yeah, so <clears throat> David A. Wheeler, I actually joined the Linux Foundation in April 2020. But and we will make adjustments. <laughs> um, so I've been work, but I've been working in open source software or developing secure software for literally decades. Um, <clears throat> as far as the, um, um, you asked what, what is my role? My, my title says I'm the director of open source supply chain security. And you know, what is the, exactly does that mean? And that means basically I'm a subject matter expert that goes around to various uh, foundations with the Linux Foundation trying to help you know, develop 
uh, more secure software that we all around the world depend on. Uh, a significant part of my work is uh, spent with OpenSSF uh, with various, you know, whatever can, can be done to help, including uh, uh, Brian mentioned this mobilization plan. I think you and I had a, like a 10 hour Zoom call trying to turn uh, all the wonderful ideas from individuals into something that looked like a cohesive whole. And in fact, I, I think uh, it, it, I'm happy with the result. Um, where did OpenSSF come from? Uh, fundamentally, a lot of people have been concerned about security and, well, security and software in general, and including open source software. Uh, because open source software is still software, it's not immune to the problems of software. Um, and so at that time, there were a number of different groups. There was the CII, Core Infrastructure Initiative, there was JOSI, there was another group called the OSSC, uh, I can't remember all explain what these acronyms stand for, but there were three different groups of organizations all interested in improving the state of security in open source software. And it really didn't make any sense to have three different groups. There were some overlaps between even some of the members. And so, hey, let's get all together, one place, work on a common goal. And so that's really the origin story of, of the open SSF is getting all together so we can all collaborate and, and address these issues that are of concern to everybody. Thank you, David. Um, and so let me also give a little bit of a background then on what led us to now, or what led us at least to, to the May meeting. Um, and by the way, I'm uh, Brian Bellendorf, Executive Director of OpenSSF. Like David, I work for the Linux Foundation. I'd actually been with the Linux Foundation for five years and kind of parachuted into the OpenSSF community in September uh, because they're frankly doing some really cool things. Uh, and it was about that pivot point where it was, all right, let's see what we can, go, what we can do going from kind of a, an ad hoc, informal, collection of great ideas and actually some great content and, and a couple of projects to a funded uh, project that can go out and tell the world about what it's doing, uh, recruit more efforts, recruit more people to come in and, and do something really ambitious. But up until that point, uh, and even, even at that point in September, the OpenSSF was kind of like other Linux Foundation projects where the role for the Linux Foundation is very much to act you could think of it as like air traffic controller, convener, facilitator. It's still up to all of the people who show up to do something, right? To build the thing. Um, and each of the Linux Foundation projects are a little bit uh, optimistic, a little amb ambitious, a little uh, aspirational might be the term. And maybe they find, uh, you know, uh, millions and millions of users like Kubernetes have uh, has. Maybe they find 10 really important users and that sustains them, right? But generally speaking, the Linux Foundation just tries to support whatever community it is that's willing to show up. We don't think like a software company, which is let's go out and, you know, get 80% of the market for this thing and, and drive everyone top down that way. It's all very bottoms up. But there was this thing that happened in December um, that I think galvanized a lot of folks' attention on the questions of not just the security of open source software in terms of vulnerabilities and the rate that they get fixed, but also um, are there weaknesses in the supply chain? Then maybe it's unfair to kind of overemphasize the log for shell uh, uh, compromise and, and, and things that had come before and, and, and in some cases since, you know, compromises in JavaScript libraries that are widely used but maintained by one person. But there is this sense in December of a mad scramble ruining lots of people's holidays uh, to go and just understand where am I running log for j let alone uh, uh, am I vulnerable to it, let alone how do I get it fixed and get out there? And the kind of people asking that question weren't just, you know, the CISOs of companies large and small, it was people like the National Security Council. <laughs> in fact, uh, we got a letter, as some companies did, and the Apache Software Foundation did, kind of, uh, in, in <coughs> sorry, inviting us to a conversation. Um, uh, you know, when you get a letter from the White House inviting you to a conversation, it's, it, it's a little bit intimidating, right? Um, but it, the, the framing of the letter was all about, you know, we're concerned. Uh, are you all okay? You know, is this is this business as usual? Which you know, no one expects software to be bug free. But you know, this is like if you were building, if you are building the bridges and highways of the digital world. You know, this is like a, a, a truck rumbling by and a, and a bridge falling, and and us going, whoops, let's just build the bridge again. Um, so so the question was, are there systematic improvements? Are there systematic things that are wrong about the open source 
process, the open source, the way we've all depended upon the, the largesse of companies and the individual selflessness of, of developers to build things that now run our digital roads and bridges and highways. Um, uh, and, or, but more importantly, are there things that could be targeted improvements that particularly the government could be helpful with? Even if it's just to focus attention on this, let alone start to make some investments. And, and to give due credit, um, the, the, uh, this administration had uh, started to make some of those uh, send some of those signals, start to make some of those investments. Uh, in May they issued, uh, of last year, they issued something called um, Executive Order 14028, which called for a whole lot of different things, among them the further adoption of softer bill of materials, and and, th and Alan Friedman here takes, <laughs> deserves a lot of credit for um, making good on that promise. <laughs> uh, uh, you probably even fed a little bit into the, the, the EO itself. Okay. Um, uh, but uh, really starting to raise the, the awareness of the importance of some, some uh, systematic improvements, not open source specific, but but here's some things that we might need to do. But in, in January, this meeting, it really was about open source software. And we all had to kind of be honest. Open source software was developed at a time when there was a lot of, when open source development was high trust, when uh, the community was smaller, when it was still not too far beyond Dunbar's number, uh, which is 150 people, right, uh, that any individual could keep in their heads social connections, and, and, and you kind of could reasonably have a chance of meeting people involved in the software you're building on top of, or your downstream users, you know, in aggregate, and, and a lot depended upon those interpersonal relationships to build the trust uh, between, between components that, that led us to um, overall reliable software. And even that's, that scaled a little bit, a lot of people decided to use the Linux kernel because they saw that Linus himself was a little bit of a badass and, and had his problems, but, but, but like he and the community around it generally developed a reputation for delivering, taking security seriously and delivering quality software, right? But that doesn't work when you're 40 million components out there, when there's thousands of dependencies being included into things now, um, when a lot of those are one-person projects on and on. So we had this meeting. Uh, it was a six-hour Zoom, Zoom call. Uh, some of us flew out for the Zoom call because it was like it was supposed to be in person, and then Omicron happened, and so it was we flew home. Um, but uh, I, I, it was a six-hour Zoom call at the end of which uh, I, they basically prompted us in the private sector to uh, come up with uh, uh, steps that might solve it. Because we certainly talked about, here's what we're doing at the OpenSSF. Uh, our peer member uh, organizations that were there said, yeah, there's a bunch of great ideas. But the, the, the thing was thrown back to us, how do you go from good ideas and even rough consensus and running code to actually solving these problems? So we took that back a little bit. Um, uh, things got a little bit complicated in, in, in uh, you know, February and March. One country invaded another. Um, but we kept uh, you know, asking the White House, like, do you want to have a follow-up meeting to kind of you know, continue this conversation? And um, in about early April, they said, yeah, why don't we do this? Um, and how about you guys convene it for us? Because we're busy. Um, but, uh, but we'll come and we'll bring the same level of people that we had attend the last meeting. We'll support you in doing this. But we'd kind of like an update. You know, we had, what are, have you all taken some of these, these goals and these issues seriously? And so starting in like early April, we in the OpenSSF scrambled a little bit and started to try to take these different ideas, some of them based on existing projects like uh, SigStore and Salsa and kind of the problems they solved. But some of them asking, you know, based on that conversation, are there new things that we could be doing? Um, things like, what, where is the center of gravity around incident response in open source projects? How do you help a project that is under-resourced uh, um, I, I, but gets a, uh, a, you know, kind of a, a notification of, of a really bad vulnerability? How do you help them walk through the guide that we've created, right, uh, for coordinated vulnerability disclosure? And yet, you know, there are certain skills that presumes, there, you know, political communication skills, <laughs> Uh, coordination skills uh, that maybe call for the kind of thing we have in other areas. You've perhaps heard of PCERT. What does the P stand for in PCERT? Product. Product, product, uh, product, secu security, incident response. product security incident response teams, you know, that, are, that kind of exist out there, but no one's really doing that for open source. Or if they do, it's kind of ad hoc and, and it's not, not well advertised. How do you scale up things like third party code, code audits, right? Um, uh, and, and, and other things that we know tend to lead to better software. Um, so we, we, we kind of assembled a set of 10 different, different ideas uh, and pulled together volunteer teams around those 10 to say, 
can we take this from more than just a one sentence or one paragraph description into a reasonable body of work, uh, a reasonable plan uh, that looks at you know one level deeper at what are some targets, what are some existing efforts that we could build upon, what are some how would we measure success in this, and then uh, based on all that, what was what's the first tranche at what's like the minimum viable team. Uh, a minimum viable product, really, uh, that over the course of a year or two years could deliver on um, some major impact on that issue, right? Uh, and that uh, uh, that those those teams kind of all scrambled <laughs> to develop a three to five pager uh, plan. Um, some of them deeper, more detailed than others. Some of them with much larger dollar figures than the other. Um, now, in that January meeting, by the way, we had said if we do this, it could cost billions of dollars. Uh, because like that's it's a it could be a lot of work right but the value we create would be even higher um, uh, I should note uh, th that it cost 700 million dollars for Equifax to pay the fine on the breach that happened uh, th was it 2018 17 um, uh, uh, due to their lack to of updating Apache struts, uh, uh, they were like a couple months behind, weren't they, or something like that. Um, and so, if you, if if one breach for one company is a seven hundred million dollar fine, <coughs> what's the economic value of having prevented that for that one company, for n number of companies, for for the industry as a whole? It it, it could be large. Um, so we we pulled these teams together. We asked them. Not that money is no object, but what's a what 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 budget would allow you to actually have an impact? We added it all up, and it came to seventy million dollars in year one, eighty million dollars in year two, um, across these ten different plans, which is like both an ambitious number when you think about the size and money associated with open source, but also really affordable compared to the impact that we think we would have. So we pulled together this meeting in, in, uh, uh, to kind of roll the plan out, to release it publicly, um, had folks there uh, at, in, in DC. And our point of going back to DC, it wasn't to go and say to the White House, like, could you, could you write us a check? You know, um, just write the check and we will solve the open source security problem, right? First off, we kind of don't think that's how procurement works, and I do want to talk a little bit about that. Um, but secondly, to try to find ways for uh, um, uh, what the, government, the investments the government is already making to align well with what we wanted to do. And, and to be clear, this was not a US government driven plan. It, the plan itself says nothing about US government shall do this or needs to do this or that we do this to align with that standard or, or, or this executive order or whatever, um, but does uh, try to lay out a template for if we do all work together and align our efforts, here's the impact we could have. So the plan has now been out. Um, uh, we've been talking a, a lot about it. Um, and we've, a couple of the teams have started now taking the next step in uh, uh, honing those plans. First off, it's a very much a draft. It's still version 0 0.9.1. Um, uh, uh, just to make it clear that this stuff was going to be a work in progress. Um, and, uh, and, but we, oh, one thing that we did get in that May meeting was a commitment from our existing member organizations, about six of them, uh, towards $30 million in pledges against that $150 million number. Now, we still have to, in each of these 10 different streams, uh, come up with, a, with an, an investable plan, right? Uh, it, it, it very much is like a startup. You have to say, here's a credible set of targets, and here's what it's going to take. And, and whether the Linux Foundation acts as the coordination for that or somebody else, we'll work the details out. We won't start the plan all at once. We'll probably start one stream, you know, a couple streams early, and then my hope is that by the end of this year, we get eight of those 10. Uh, we're running in some way, maybe all 10. Um, but uh, uh, that's now the hard work, the, the, the sausage making, I think, uh, uh, to actually get this stuff implemented. Um, uh, but I'm really excited about where we got. And we've already received some interest from other governments in having a similar conversation. So with all of that put together and said, now we are trying to figure out um, I, I, how, to, how, to, how to work with government to go forward with this, um, but also now take an honest step back. This was a sprint by many of these teams, uh, including the, 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 the two-day kind of 16-hour you know, Zoom call sprint between David and I to try to align those things. We took a whole lot of liberties, and a lot of it is kind of throwing things on the wall. But some of that uh, I, uh, perhaps doesn't mesh uh, cleanly with the reality of how things are actually going to work on the ground. Um, so I'd kind of like to throw to the panel, um, and maybe Trey, I could start with you. Um, when you read the plan, and you did contribute a couple pieces of it, deeply appreciated that. Um, you know, what were the things that perhaps you saw that were um, uh, either missed opportunities or places we could have done done more with the plan? Yeah, no, appreciate that. And I think you know, a credit to Open SSF. This was something pulled together. It was it was a way to scope mitigation of a software set of software risks that I think hadn't really been done at that level before. It's one of the challenges that we're trying to address 
us and I think OpenSSF is trying to address with the mobilization plan is this is not vendor specific, it's not vertical specific, it really is across the ecosystem. And so these are significant interleaving sources of risk in how you build software, how you attribute software, how you attest to the security of software um, that affect a massive diversity of programs and, and packages. So, so two things I think that we're, that we're hopeful to try to, uh, to help you guys grow on and I think maybe nudge on in the next year and a half is, one, we recognize that all 10 of these aren't gonna succeed in the same way. And we recognize that there are a finite number of contributors, there's a finite amount of resources inside of this community now to do this kind of very sophisticated security engineering. So of the 10, where do we need to start? What's gonna have the greatest impact relative to the risk that we see today? And of the 10, which is most likely to succeed against its stated goals? And I think those are two different questions. Answering them in parallel is gonna be a really important process for this community as we go forward. And it's an area where I think having some government uh, demand signals is gonna be useful as a way of understanding the space. Not because what we're doing with the mobilization plan needs to be responsive entirely to what the US government or the Japanese government or the French government wants, but because they're a consumer for this kind of information. They are an assessor of this kind of risk. So they're a stakeholder in this community as we go. So I think that's one area is really thinking about prioritization. Um, the second thing that I think about though is a lot of the folks in this room, how do you all plug into this? Right? How do you take the efforts, the, the, maybe the spare volunteer time you have, the existing program and security work that you're doing, either with a company or as an independent, and plug into these 10 work streams? Because these are really, I think the word stream is very helpful. They're guides, they're the opening of a conversation, right? They're a place to channel resources, time, and energy. Um, and as we're thinking about this from the policy standpoint, how can we help US, the US government and other entities understand where the gaps are? Where are volunteer energies naturally gonna concentrate? Where are the parts that are missing? What's the stuff that's just hard to get a lot of PR press for, hard to get a lot of company effort for, places where resources aren't necessarily being flowed in that same way to support these streams? And so I think the, the other aspect of this is really thinking about for you all, how can you help? How can you contribute? Where do you plug into this? And so I think that's somewhere that all the work streams are gonna to need to be thinking about more aggressively is how do I get people involved in this process? Thanks, Thanks Trey. Uh, Amelie, uh, based on uh, I kind of the parts of the plan that you've seen uh, the, uh, uh, and the conversations that we had uh, with the, uh, the, the House Committee on Science uh, uh, the day before the plan was released, um, and looking at the questions that they asked, uh, uh, do you think there's parts of this plan that are responsive to concerns of folks like beyond the, the people we had in that room? Uh, and, and what do you think, I mean, uh, put yourself back in, that, uh, in those situations where you, where you were working inside government. If the private sector came, up, came to you with this plan and said, we want to engage with your organizations in, in the rollout of this, how, what, what would have been your reaction to it? Like, how would it? Have, how do you think it was received uh, on 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 uh, within uh, um, within within the executive branch within agencies? Well, thinking back to the the time where um, you know the, the first major wake up call was, and this was mentioned in testimony, which was the Heartbleed incident back in 2014. That was kind of the the first. Oh my gosh, open source software exists, and and the reactivity to it was was to send out a data call to find out what web servers it was because it was open SSL. So the literacy of what open source software was, but what it contributed has definitely increased over time. Um, you know, I, my first interactions with that committee was way back in 1998 and my second job out of college and, and did some stuff and they were amazed that, you know, I had a laptop and all sorts of stuff. So, you know, having folks on, on, the, on the, uh, the panel there that was, uh, you know, were versing in AI and machine learning and, and, you know, former software developers and whatnot was a benefit. But, uh, you know, thinking about like, you know, talking about the SBOM everywhere, you know, for me, you know, my, my contributions when I was at the Office of Management Budget during um, uh, the Heartbleed incident, you know, something like an SBOM would have been very useful for the response. Um, that is definitely something that, you know, with a historical eye towards that, that would have been useful. Uh, you know, it, didn't, it wouldn't have taken me to say, hey, uh, you know, these libraries exist in your cell phones, exist in your networking equipment, uh, other applications because they were compiled in. They weren't, I, I don't think people at the time were really aware of the prevalence of open source software because it didn't, you know, much like SBOM there was like, it wasn't an ingredients list. No one had an idea, even in commercial software, what existed. Now, because uh, with Log4j and a couple other incidents since then, 
uh, you know, folks are realizing that even the commercial vendors are, you know, liberally picking from the open source ecosystem to kind of, you know, rapidly increase capabilities and features of not only the software that they're, you know, selling, you know, in embedded devices like, you know, your your smart TVs and stuff at home, but also, you know, anytime it, it, someone acts, accesses um, a cloud provider, uh, a lot of that infrastructure, that digital infrastructure that's there is all based on open source. Um, software uh, components and, and, and whatnot. And when those things go down, you know, that root cause analysis, uh, you know, is one of the, the biggest challenges there because you're having to kind of, you know, work through all those dependencies. So, you know, say Amazon goes out, then they're looking at what service it was and then what's, what software supports that service. And if it's based on a bunch of open source libraries, who do you got to contact to basically fix those vulnerabilities or those issues? And that's that's one of those challenges I don't think necessarily got conveyed very well, but we're at the first step here uh, to Congress to understand that you know code is infrastructure at this point in time and to treat it like you know your roads, your waterways, uh, your transport, the rest of your transportation systems, your power delivery, uh, you know, even equating it to say, you know, the whole issues with the ransomware with the uh, uh, colonial pipeline issue, uh, you know, say a develop, you know, we had an incident roughly uh, earlier this year where, you know, you had a, a, an open source developer that was frustrated with not getting paid and decided to kind of put a message in a, in a library. Uh, you know, where, how do you kind of control that process and, and, and build that trust as well? And I don't think that awareness still exists at this point. It's still, you know, we're, it, because we're tickling this, more and more of that awareness is starting to come out. And I think that's going to be the biggest challenge is the, are those next steps. And also, uh, you know, my big thing with government is uh, even though it's, it has a significant size to it, um, it can't be everywhere all the time. Uh, people don't scale well and the government doesn't really scale well. Uh, you know, you can see that for, for stuff, uh, you know, we have natural disasters and whatnot. There's a finite amount of resources that can be applied. It's just a matter of where the best points are to, to kind of reinforce the, the comments that Trey and Brian made. Yeah, I think um, there was a moment that was, <laughs> there was one moment where it was like uh, the enterprise world realized they could use open source code legitimately. I mean, people had been using it quietly under the covers for a long time, even before that moment. But, but then it was like, all right, there's companies like IBM and, and, and Red Hat, now obviously part of IBM, uh, but, but others who were starting HP and others who said, okay, this is, this is goodness, we'll incorporate it in. And then there was a distinctly later moment, uh, uh, by a couple of years at least, where you started to see them return patches. Um, I'd say actually IBM very early on uh, in the Linux and, and Apache communities, but in mass, this recognition that use was a two-way street, that as a user, you're always gonna find you know, insufficiencies, bugs, you know, uh, improvements to docs, and that as a first order principle of use, being able to contribute back upstream to open source is important. I don't know that we've ever gotten there with at least the US federal government um, as a first order principle that if agencies use externally developed open source code, they should contribute back upstream. But I wonder if we're about to see a change in that. Um, uh, and, and I mean, the optimist in me, right? You know, I wonder if we're about to see uh, 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 perhaps a recognition that as a national security thing, investing in the underlying security of, again, bridges and highways and code is a critical infrastructure argument. Um, at least I, I was hearing tendrils of that in the conversations we had with them. Is that just optimism speaking or is uh, it, to me or is that something of substance? Let me actually ask as that as a follow-up to Amelie. Uh, uh, oh, I, I was gonna say, I, just the, the, uh, the NSA has entered the chat, you know, kind of thing where <laughs> commit, commits to the tree where, you know, you didn't see them before. Um, yeah, I, I mean, uh, you know, to think back, you mentioned Linux before, you know, the whole idea of uh, SE Linux that was addressing that particular issue way back when. Uh, and now, you know, I don't know of anybody who actively uses SE Linux because it was such a pain to kind of configure, but it solved a particular problem. Now, you know, I know having been at OMB right around the time they were doing the uh, open source uh, policy, that was the biggest difficulty we had, which was to find the right levers to get people to contribute back. Um, it wasn't that there weren't CTOs and CIOs and developers within the federal government that didn't want to. Uh, it just that there wasn't a process or a mechanism or governance behind that. Um, I even found that, you know, after I left the government for the first time, um, you know, I went to a large media conglomerate and they had just gotten through a multi-year process to allow, you know, open source contributions back. So it, it is literally, there's an inertia that needs to be overcome both on the public and private sector. And it's just a matter of someone, sometimes it's just 
a matter of willpower and somebody uh, to kind of champion that. And I think that's probably mirrored across a lot of organizations. Uh, uh, David, yeah, no, David, David, by the way, co-authored the or, or wrote the original open sources COTS memo, uh, which allowed so many people, at least in the DOD, <laughs> yeah. to justify, hey, we can use this stuff. Like it's just like commercial off the shelf. Yeah, it, it was a 2009 um, DOD Sorry. policy and open source software. Yeah. And uh, but you're right, uh, that was actually one of my earlier presentations that got into that uh, <laughs> policy and got me involved in some of that. Um, uh, qu quick comments. I, we already are seeing occasional release from governments, and not just the U.S. government, but governments as open source software. You may have heard of the internet. Uh, you know that's due to both development of the protocols and development of open source and release. Most of, you know you're either using one of those open source um, you know stacks or another stack that was written after looking at those open source ones. Uh, and you know, you mentioned um, you know, SE Linux. If you're using Android, if you're using Red Hat Enterprise Linux, it's using that. There's, there's more. But that said, Brian, what you said earlier is absolutely true. The amount of contribution back from certainly from the U.S. government is far below what it could, and I would argue should be. Now, there are cases where it makes sense not to, but there's far more cases where. You know, they're shooting themselves in the foot by not participating and collaborating. And although I know a little less about other governments, I suspect that's true for many other governments as well. Because as you mentioned, you know, this is not a U.S. only problem. This is a global challenge and we need to work globally for it. Well, I want to uh, pull us back to the, the, the plan a little bit. Uh, and I do want to leave some time for a couple of questions as well, if, if any of you have them. Uh, but and, and I apologize. I, what, I don't think we had the time to go through like all 10 of them and give enough of a, of a, of a presentation to help you understand each of them. But I certainly want to highlight a few of, uh, of them as, 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 as noteworthy. Uh, but you can go get the plan from the OpenSF website, of course. Uh, but uh, David, what's, what's your take on, on which of the streams you think uh, we might, uh, well, first off, are most fundable, like are the ones that are we can get, could most likely get started with most quickly, and then the ones that are perhaps ripest for collaboration with government. Well, as far as that first question, you know, we actually worked hard to make sure that all those streams were things that we could do in the near term. We weren't trying to create, hey, do this research, and in 30 years, maybe something will pop out. They're all very much, you can at least have a basic idea of what they do. Um, I would say, for example, six doors, the six door streams is particularly, uh, particularly straightforward, in part because it's very specifically focused, and that makes it easier to execute. Um, but I think all of them can, you know, we can at least get started on. Uh, I mean, the education piece, we've already done some work. It's, I think there's some clear steps forward. And really, I think that's true for all of them. I, I think after a certain point, there's a Yes, you need to plan, but you need to actually start executing instead of just admiring and creating better plans. Well, uh, there's, there's the saying, plans are irrelevant, planning is essential, right? right? Um, or no plan survives first contact with the enemy. I don't know who the enemy is in this case. But, um, <laughs> but one, let me highlight a, a, one of them then, which is uh, the one we ca called S-bombs everywhere uh, in uh, uh, stream number nine. And in, it wasn't just about echoing, hey, S-bombs are important, let's throw money at it. It was also about trying to say the kind of future that I think we want is one where software bill of materials are assembled continuously throughout the supply chain, starting as far upstream as you can, by default by the development tools, so that it's a minimal lift for developers to pick up. Uh, and, and is something that is pervasively created and, and easily created all the way through, rather than the alternative, which it seems like we're trending towards in some places, where um, SBOMs are assembled at the very end as a to hit a certification checklist. And because it's a lot of work to do it at the end, the companies that do it see that as a proprietary value rather than as something that's ubiquitous and, and frankly open source, right? Uh, and, and to do that, the, the, the logic was, well, we should be investing in tooling that embeds it into the build tools and the infrastructure and makes it easy, makes them easy to validate. The challenge there is that uh, there's a couple of different formats with adoption out there. And uh, uh, Alan Sissa very helpfully told us, any of these formats will work, so use them all. Uh, but <laughs> Um, which uh, is kind of like saying, hey, DNS, you know, like, there could be two or three of them. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, but so what is, it actually triggered, though, was a bunch of us in the SBOM community saying, 
Well, what do we have in common? Is there a, a greatest common de you know, denominator to uh, the security use cases and the security metadata that's worth tracking? And could we find a way to have uh, convertibility between these different formats around some core data sets, uh, data attributes and, and a taxonomy so that you could use these different formats to some degree interchangeably, right? Um, uh, and that's, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to do in practice, but if, you, uh, if, you, if, if we could channel investment into tooling, um, that would make that easier to at least validate different languages, different, different formats like SPDX, CycloneDX, then that would avoid us having to get into a holy war of, of like one, one format overall, right? So I, um, that's where the streams actually served as an opportunity to have some provocative conversations about the right strategy, right? And, and that I found like one of the most valuable uh, parts of it. Um, uh, now, government doesn't have to help us fund that work, but uh, given the, the, the role that not only Executive Order 1408, uh, 028 played in that, but also things we've seen out of the Department of Health and Human Services around S-bombs for medical devices, right, that we see potentially in other regulated industries uh, uh, or in the automotive industry. They're starting to talk a lot of it, uh, about this as well. Um, I have a, 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 a lot of confidence that they can create the pull for what otherwise would just be you know, a checklist, nice to have bureaucratic kind of thing. But I th still think it's up to us in the open source community to figure out how to create the supply uh, on that side to meet that demand. Uh, any other thoughts, though, that come specifically from uh, the SBOM uh, kind of stream uh, and things that practically we'll have to do to, to get that uh, launched and, and, and any, any po uh, other possibilities you see with working with government? Yeah, yeah, obviously, you've already mentioned, you know, tooling, tooling, tooling. We, we need to make this as easy as possible, as default as possible. Uh, I don't think it's going to be instantaneously done in a day. I, I think there is a fundamental challenge with SBOM specifically because it's not something that traditionally we've done, we meaning the software development community. And what's, I guess, worse in a sense is it's primarily a help to the end user. It's not necessarily as, you know, it's something the developer does to help the ones downstreams, not necessarily the themselves. Yeah, I, I see Alan going, yeah, yeah. The, the, the problem is we need, you know, there's an incentives challenge. And we really need to try to help incentivize and, and bring down the, uh, the barriers okay. to uh, application. Uh, and I'll throw one more question uh, to, uh, oh, Amelie, you wanted to comment on that too? Yeah, I actually had an entire uh, Twitter thread because I woke up inspired this morning on this. But, um, and I think this may, may appeal because I tagged Alan about 7,000 times in it. Um, <laughs> But Alan you know, is the fifth Beatle on this panel, by the way. Yeah, yeah, he's definitely so. Um, but you know, having come from you know, done an executive level thing as a CIO and a CTO, uh, and a background in decision science, one of the, the biggest things that is a gap between cool, we've got a tool or we've got a format or some type of interchange, something or other, where that, and I think Dave touched on this about, um, uh, the end user, the end user also needs to be a decision maker. So if you have a CTO uh, looking at, you know, reports of S-bombs, the idea is, is like, well, how bad is my risk of using this? There, there's a lot of times you just can't tear it out when you highlight, hey, I've got a bunch of vulnerable libraries. It's stuff you may have bought. It's stuff you may have built. Um, so providing that in a format or having tooling that gives you that kind of ability to score and do an assessment there is, is that next level up that uh, needs to occur. Um, so a lot of this is really good because it's, you know, the, the, the work plan addresses more at that technical engineering level, but the next step for all of this is then that extra level of engagement to uh, senior leaders who are the ones literally writing the checks and, and making those decisions about like, you know, hey, we're going to do, uh, you know, this mission support thing, whether it be, you know, I'm going to be using government terms here, but, you know, basically align with the, the business operations of the mission here. Um, you know, what kind of uh, capabilities can I have? If I need to use this and no one else provides it, what is the risk and what kind of mitigations do I need to put in place? And that's where, you know, that, uh, you know a well-defined SBOM um, that has, you know, tags, extra fields, you know, if you look at the standards and stuff like that that's being proposed, can, can actually provide some extra value. So that's how you can kind of use that to sell that up to, to folks who are in the, the position of, you know, writing the checks, pushing the buttons and so forth. Thanks, Emily. I, we have time for one question. I, 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 Jeff, I think you had your hand up. Um, oh, fl flag that she had a question. Does anyone out there have a question? Oh, yes. I have a question. It goes back to when you're talking about government giving back. Yeah. And so when you're looking at government, and so when you're looking at government, 
government even back. There's a logistics and a practicality issue because a lot of the software is being developed by a contracted individual, right? Mm -hmm. Governments don't really understand licensing and open source, right? How that works. And as a develop I am a developer. I want to give back to you, but the organization or the agency that I work with, they don't get open source, so I'm making it for us. I want to give it to you. But then they're saying, isn't that ours? Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just repeat for the uh, uh, for Amelie and others' uh, sake. I um, so uh, what was your name? My name is Raven. I work for Smithsonian. Raven, uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Raven works for the Smithsonian. She works on open source software. Smithsonian is quasi governmental. I mean, our, our, Government educational, and uh, her point was that there isn't yet a culture of IP give back. That IP is seen as something you lock down, um, uh, and 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 it feels like there's still a, a, either a culture shift, a mindset, a mindset shift that that needs to happen. Um, I mean, Trey, do you see that as well? Do you see places where that is changing? Are there parts of government changing faster? Well, so I think there's there's two things that are really important about this, and and you've hit on one of them, which is at the moment, government still treats open source as a product that they buy and use. And so the expectation of I bought it, it's mine, yeah. right, still really locks in. And I think, Amelie, to your point about the anonymous large global media company, right, that went through this challenge is there's a, there's a cultural shift that's going to take place at the organizational level about defining what open source is. That's a, it's a change that will have to be reflected in policy. But I think the higher level part of this is shifting to the discussion about open source as infrastructure as opposed to product. And where there is understanding by policymakers, by the executives who run these agencies, by Congress when they're apportioning budgets and making rules about procurement, where they recognize that it's in the national interest to see commits back upstream, to see contributions back into the ecosystem, that it's helping not just other agencies, but it's actually pushing back into the private sector. It's driving economic value. That's where a lot of that sea change is going to come. And I think that's part of the conversation that you all and that we need to be a part of is you're not buying products anymore. You're supporting the roads and the bridges that everybody is using. But that's that's absolutely a shift. Yeah, if, if I can quick. One, one, one quick, yeah. Yeah, quick. Um, so if you're working specifically with the U.S. government, there are some key things you need to to understand about how the FAR and the DFARs work. Well, she key, probably does already. Yeah, okay, that's, that's fine. And you, if you do that, that's <laughs> wonderful. And, and also the folks you work with, which you may not. Um, all too often, the issue isn't who holds the copyright. The question is who holds which rights. Um, so you need to track that down. Um, some organizations, for example, the Department of Defense, they actually have a formal policy that says we encourage release back if there's a good reason to do so. And one of those is to, is to make it so that the future versions will have the fixes because otherwise uh, project forks come up all over the place. People have to fix it 50, 70 times. So there's very good reasons to avoid it. And the problem is really, I think, in part, a matter of education of various decision makers. And Amelie, we're, we're right at time. Any closing thoughts from you on uh, other, other guidance that you could give to folks in government uh, or to government in, in general about encouraging kind of give backs and participation in big efforts like OpenSSF, the mobilization plan, others? Um, it, yeah, yeah, promises promise. that it won't bite much. Uh, you know, what, <laughs> what you mentioned from, from, from the Smithsonian was, was the, you know, it, it is a culture change. I know that was the, the biggest, you know, change, sea change I saw from interacting with government originally, which was, you know, I don't trust it because I don't trust the, the lineage of it. It could come from China, Russia, whatever. Any of those folks that the, the DSS doesn't like us to, to work with. Um, to, but understand, uh, you know, I think uh, Ava uh, commented on my Twitter feed, this thing about uh, trust the process, not the person. And I want to give her credit for that, um, or they, them credit for it, sorry, pronouns. Um, and, that, and that's the key thing is, is understand, you know, for the, the automation that it does have eyes on, it does get checked. If we get these work streams in place where there's third party code audit, which allows that independence of, you know, not just trusting that person or maybe where they're from, but the process, that builds the trust and that builds the scaffolding that's going to be required for governments, both the U.S. and elsewhere, to basically consume it without the fear. Um, and, and that partakes then into that culture change because there's no second guessing, much like we have with FedRAM, which is it goes through a FedRAM process and then yet another agency goes and, and basically refed ramps it. So, uh, you know, to, 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 to dedupe the work, that's, that's the key thing about building that trust and following these things within the work streams. Thank you, Amelie. Thank you, David. Thank you, Trey. Uh, thank you, Raven. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it for our session. Thank you all very much.